Now we're going to talk about another very successful woman artist of the Renaissance. And as you can see, she's a little bit younger uh, than uh, Sophonisba. And in fact, oftentimes there were um, references made to, you know, to her trying to emulate Sophonisba. Um, but she's very alike in the sense that she has to uh, you know, show that she's proper and she has to please the aristocrats and things. But she's very different in that she is not an aristocrat. Although she kind of takes on that persona. We'll, we'll, we'll see how this works. Uh, Lavinia Fontana was the daughter and the only child of the Bolognese painter Prospero Fontana. Now, if she'd been a boy, there'd been no question. You know, she'd been trained by her father to be, she, you know, to be a, trained by her father to be a painter. But she's the only child, right? And uh, the father seems to be quite forward-thinking, um, and he decides that he will train his daughter and uh, arrange her career. I'm sure that some of that is concern for his daughter, and some of it is concern for himself. Uh, when he gets old, who's going to support him? You know, <laughs> um, and who's going to support her? Well, you know, she. We'll see. We'll see how this all works. So she is trained by her father to have a career as an artist, and she's promoted. Um, you know, he is very interested in her skill and having it known and uh, having commissions for her. Um, this is you know, both because he wants his daughter to be successful and undoubtedly he wants himself to have uh, the benefits when he's in his old age and can no, no longer support himself that, you know, his daughter will be able to do it. Uh, and they won't be just dependent on uh, whoever her husband might be. Uh, in fact, the fathers generally arranged marriages for their daughters uh, at this time. And in uh, 1577, she was married. Uh, it was an arranged marriage with one of her father's pupils, Jean Paolo Zappi. Now, when the father made this, this uh, marriage, he made it some conditions. He wasn't going to marry his daughter to anybody who would take her away. And that's probably one reason he picks a pupil, because then the pupil uh, knows that you know, eventually uh, you know, the workshop will become the daughter's. You know, so he continual work there. At um, any rate, uh, the father arranges the marriage with his pupil, Zoppy, <laughs> on the condition that the couple live with him, live with the father, and Lavinia continues to work. And that seems to be satisfactory to everybody. One of the interesting things is Zoppy evidently wasn't as good an artist as, as Lavinia. And he eventually becomes an assistant. Uh, some people even suggest that he helps uh, take care of the household. I don't know about that at all. Uh, she has 11 children. Now, not all of those survive to adulthood. Um, some of them survive you know, into their teenage years or whatever. Only three of them survive their mother. Um, but she's having to support later on when her, her father gets older, uh, him, uh, she supports her husband, she supports herself, and she supports however many of her children, you know, say four or more, uh, are living. Uh, so she's the support of the family. And one of the things I keep wondering is how, with 11 children, even with four children, she would have had time to do this. Now, presumably, she's quite successful. We'll see this in her pictures. And uh, she has nursemaids to take care of the children. Uh, Zoppi becomes, uh, we said, her assistant. He probably does, uh, you know, puts on backgrounds and grinds paint and things like that. Um, he also becomes her business manager. And this makes a lot of sense because a lot of times women are not allowed to contra make contracts without father or husband uh, approval. So if he's her business manager, that works out beautifully. Um, her patrons include particular, well, nobles of all kinds, but particularly noble ladies. Once again, there is that idea of if you have yourself portrayed by a woman artist, you know, your uh, reputation is completely intact. <laughs> uh, but even cardinals and popes uh, uh, collect her work. Um, the, at, at some point, she, they also actually moved from Bologna from Bologna, uh, to Rome uh, because the, a lot of their patronage is there. 
and a couple of fairly famous names is Cardinal Scipione Borghese and Pope Paul V. Uh, Scipione Borghese, some of you may know as the patron of uh, Bernini in his 20s. Uh, the uh, Bernini David, the uh, Pluto and Persephone, uh, Apollo and Daphne, and of course uh, portrait busts of uh, Cardinal Scipione Borghese uh, by Bernini are terribly well known. So the same man is uh, patronizing, is giving, uh, is buying pictures from Lavinio Fontana, as is the Pope. Um, I've been using this portrait uh, medal of Lavinia Fontana uh, to show you, and this of course was done very, very late in her life after she'd had all of her fame, but it's kind of interesting because they had this portrait medal uh, created in honor of Lavinia Fontana uh, from 1611, and you have the, of course the classical bust portrait uh, which comes down to us from, the, from uh, classical antiquity, and you'd have you know, coins with the emperors in the profile, and the Renaissance starts uh, continuing on that tradition. And then on the back you have an allegory. And uh, you see this female figure. Uh, is it a portrait or is it just a gen generalized female figure? Hard to tell because it's quite small. Uh, but it's a female figure of, uh, uh, of a woman who is painting, probably a personification of painting. And uh, she has this wild Medusa-like hair. They're not snakes. It's just hair going out in an artistic frenzy. Uh, so this is supposed to symbolize the divine inspiration or the genius of the artist. Uh, genius of the artist, that is uh, an idea that grew up during the Renaissance. And here, Lavinia Fotana is at uh, the later part of the Renaissance uh, in uh, the era of mannerism. And uh, by this time, you know, there's, it has been uh, at least established in uh, Italy among uh, noble circles that uh, great artists uh, can be divinely inspired just like poets. And uh, they can be recognized as, as geniuses. Usually we think of people like uh, Raphael or Michelangelo uh, as being the ones, but uh, here it's, it's uh, you know, the idea that uh, Lavinia Fontana has some genius as well. One of the interesting things about her is she seems to be the first woman in Catholic Europe to paint large altarpieces systematically. Um, we saw that uh, Katharina von Hamessen uh, may have contributed to some altarpieces, uh, but we know that Lavinia Fontana actively sought these commissions and uh, did a number of large altarpieces. Uh, she also, it's kind of interesting, you know, obviously male and female artists are doing Marian paintings, but it's always interesting to see how a woman interprets them. So uh, she also does, uh, you know, Mary as the subject. And uh, she has been associated, uh, her religious art has been associated with the idea of counter-reformation, piety, and decorum. Um, I need to say a little bit about that. Um, the Council of Trent in the middle of the 16th century uh, made a number of declarations and decrees, and they made one very short, small one. <laughs> uh, about art. And they said that basically a religious art should be decorous, which meant that it should be appropriate to the subject. Uh, this is the time uh, when uh, a pope uh, calls in Daniela Voltari to paint breaches on Michelangelo's uh, Last Judgment because there's just too much naked genitals and buttocks and other things hanging out uh, in the Pope's chapel, the Sistine Chapel, and that's not uh, uh, decorous, although, let's face it, at the Last Judgment, who's wearing clothes? Uh, but it was, they had uh, Daniela Voltari now became known as the breeches painter because he painted uh, breeches and loincloths and cloth all over uh, uh, Michelangelo's painting. Um, they were very concerned that the art uh, be appropriate to the subject and to the doctrine, and that any extra things in it, once again, be appropriate. Um, you may have heard the story about Veronese, who paints this huge Last Supper. I mean, it's, it's I think it's 42 feet wide. It's just gigantic, and he's put in extras 
He's got dogs and buffoons and just, you know, all sorts of people that would be at a rich person's feast. And he gets called into the Inquisition and they say, this is not decorous. It's not appropriate for a painting of the sacrament. You've got to change it. Well, there's no way he can change this humongous painting, which probably took him years to do. So he changes the name. He writes a Bible ver he writes, I think, was it Luke 25, whatever it is. But uh, it says, now it's no longer the Last Supper, it's the feast in the house of Simon. He's a rich man, he's allowed to have all this stuff. That seemed to satisfy the Venetians. I don't know if it was satisfied uh, the Spanish, but it was satisfied the Venetians, and that's what he had to worry about. But the point that I'm trying to make with these whole stories is um, that they wanted art to be proper in a uh, certain sense. And I don't necessarily mean um, you know, that you couldn't have nude figures, but they had to be appropriate. You know, they weren't supposed to uh, attract lewd and lascivious thought. Now, that said, we're talking about religious painting. As you'll see, um, that the rule was not for, say, classical art. You could be as lascivious as you want with that, <laughs> uh, but uh, religious art. Okay, we're looking at a picture of the Holy Family uh, with Saints Margaret, who is kneeling, uh, and the lower left as we look at it, and uh, Saint Francis, who is right above her, uh, looking at the Christ Child, or looking actually he's looking at a crucifix, sort of in the direction of the Christ Child. Um, and then, of course, there's Saint Joseph. Uh, and then Mary and the baby Jesus in this kind of uh, cradle, sarcophagus, manger, whatever it is. Uh, it looks like it'd be rocked, so I guess it's, it looks like classical cradle of some kind. Um, it is appropriate in every bit because it shows the mother motherly love of the Virgin. The people who are there are saints and they're behaving properly. Uh, you see a really interesting combination of styles in Lavinia Fontana. Uh, many, many times she's using mannerist elegance, these elongated figures uh, with poses that we sometimes feel are somewhat mannered, uh, but that would be what was, a, was considered appropriate for the time. Uh, for example, here where um, Margaret is kneeling and crossing her hands over her breast. But you know, this is a show of piety. Uh, she is adoring the Christ child. Uh, and so we have this mannerist elegance, and you can see that particularly, I think, in Mary. Also, the details are very, very naturalistic. So this was the same thing that, you remember, Sophonispa sought to have um, a lot of wonderful details in clothing and costumes, and Lavinia Fontana, as we'll see, does this as well. Uh, but also, you know, the, uh, the details can be in religious pictures as well. Uh, Christ Child is very, very lively, as you can see. <laughs> it looks like he's going to wiggle right out of his mother's arms, and he is blessing the, uh, the saint who is kneeling before him. Now, this, of course, is a picture uh, showing uh, piety of the saints and probably showing us how we should behave and how we should uh, uh, give our devotion to Christ and to his mother, um, you know, as the, as the, the viewer. Um, but it has been suggested that this may have a personal meaning for Lavinia Fontana. Um, she, had, she, had a, she had conceived two children in the first year of marriage and um, they both died. So her first two children died. Um, and St. Margaret, you see below, is the patron saint of childbirth. And she is the person that you call upon to help you through childbirth and also to help, you know, that your children will live. So maybe she is evoking St. Margaret in the hope that there will be future children who will live. Um, St. Francis isn't directly associated with childbirth, uh, but he is contemplating a crucifix, which of course refers to the death of Christ, but also the resurrection. So perhaps you know, it's been suggested this painting combines elements of birth and death. Um, and Christ child, of course, is the, uh, uh, by Christian theology, would be the uh, incarnate God who uh, is born into human flesh and dies on the cross to save all mankind, uh, including uh, her two deceased children. Um, so, you know, there, there is a possible personal reference in this picture. Here is, um, Lavinia Fontana didn't do as many self-portraits as uh, Sophonis Baguesola, but she did do some. And here is uh, one of the uh, self-portraits. 
uh, from 1577. This would have been done just before her marriage, presumably, because uh, uh, she's, uh, she styles herself a Virgo. Um, uh, so she signed it, she's dated it, uh, Lavinia Virgo, uh, Lavinia Virgin Prospero, uh, would be, of course, her name, Fontana, Filia, so Lavinia Virgin, daughter of Prospero Fontana. And then she says, ex speculo imagina, imagine, uh, from the mirror I imaged it. Sorry for the <laughs> rough translation there, but she's talking about she, she created this from, from looking in a mirror. Uh, and then uh, she also gives us the date of 1577. So in her inscription, she tells us that she is a virgin. She tells us that she's the daughter of a Prospero Fontana. So she is asserting uh, her propriety. Uh, she is uh, bringing in her family connection. And she also has that same motif that we've seen uh, before, uh, the idea that uh, she, since she's painted her image from a mirror, uh, you can think back to the uh, classical uh, artist, yeah, yeah, <laughs> or Marcia, uh, who also painted her image from a mirror. Now, to me, it always seems like the the spacing of this seems a little awkward, and you'll see that sometimes she does have some awkward spacing in her complex pictures. Other times, you know, it, it works out beautifully. Uh, but here she's at this very high point of view, and I wonder if the high point of view, which seems a little awkward to me, is really to show us things. We're looking down on the keyboard, so we can see she's playing that keyboard instrument, you know, the virginals. Uh, we should be looking down on her maidservant holding the music open. You know, she's accomplished in music as well as painting. And in the background, there's a little alcove with a window, and there sits the easel that testifies that she is a painter. So like Sofonis Baguesolo, Lavinia Fontana styles herself as a chaste young woman. Uh, who is playing the virginals. She is chaperoned. And this is presumably before her marriage, which took place in June of 1577. Um, Lavinia's clothing seems to be much more elaborate. It may be that styles are changing and becoming more elaborate. It also may be that Lavinia felt that she had to insist uh, visually <laughs> on uh, her status. She is from the middle class. She's an artist. She has to work for a living. Um, she is not of noble blood the way uh, Sophonispa's family, uh, even if they were recently noble, they were noble. Uh, and so Lavinia, however, is dealing with people who are noble, and she has to fit in. So she styles herself a lady of leisure who can uh, leave her easel and go and uh, make music on her uh, clavichord or spinet or whichever musical instrument it is. Um, and uh, she's dressing uh, in a way that would be uh, thought of as an aristocratic noble woman. Uh, so Sophonispa can dress a little more simply. She uh, doesn't have to perhaps ins it, it show all the embroidery and, uh, and things. Um, maybe also that her uh, uh, Lavinia is about to get married, so that will also ensure that she has a position in society. This is a self-portrait that's a bit later. It's smaller, and I think in uh, some ways it's certainly much more accomplished, certainly the spatial relationships here. Uh, self-portrait in a studio in a round, uh, it's, uh, it's painted on copper, really precious um, material uh, to, to paint on. Um, and it's six and a quarter inches in diameter. Now, this was um, a request. <laughs> uh, one of the things that uh, uh, people would do is they would have in their studies uh, paintings of famous men, or sometimes famous women. And uh, Alfonso Chacon, who was a Spanish Dominican, and uh, was a collector. Uh, he requested from Lavinia a portrait that he wanted to place near his portrait of Sofonispa Aguisola. 
uh, which would be placed in his collection of paintings of famous men and at least two famous women, uh, Sophonisba and Lavinia Fontana. So you can see that that parallel is being made of these uh, unusual women artists uh, who are, uh, have, have a good deal of fame at, at their time. Uh, we're looking at her self, uh, Lavinia Fontana's self-portrait in a studio from 1579. Uh, and she's seated at the desk drawing. Uh, the pose is like a scholar writing. Now, she's in a studio. And in the background, you see all of these antique statues and bits of statuary. And uh, it has been suggested that where she's portraying herself is her father's studio. Uh, because her father was supposed to have kept collections of antiquities and curiosities. So by placing her, not showing her actually painting, or she's drawing, but he's placing her in this kind of position in a study with classical uh, and possibly Renaissance uh, uh, sculpture, little statuettes, um, that it is suggesting her learning and her link to classical antiquity. Now, how much real learning she had, uh, I don't know, but she's poised that way. And once again, she's just wearing this beautiful clothing with this wonderful ruff uh, and uh, pattern sleeve, um, which would make her fit right in with the uh, aristocratic up, upper uh, class circles.